encouragement to you as we go. Excited today to have Cliff Duran, who's worship pastor at FBC. Cliff, I'm going to ask him to just give a little bit of his story and his background. You have likely used some piece of music or some arrangement of his in some form or fashion. God's used him in an incredible way. And so, hey, Cliff, thank you so much for being here with us today. And uh, yeah, why don't we just start off and you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you and your background in ministry. You got it, man. I'm so grateful to be a part of this call today. So thanks for the for the invite. Um, it's a real it's a real pleasure. Um, yeah, so I uh, what a doozy of a first year at uh, First Baptist Woodstock. So we, uh, 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 I'll circle back a little bit, but in this past year, our senior pastor of uh, three decades, Pastor Johnny Hunt, transitioned. Um, uh, out of uh, into a pastor emeritus role. Uh, Jeremy Morton is our senior pastor now. So they served together for 18 months as co-pastors. Um, and uh, it, that transition uh, happened in January. Um, it went really well. Um, a very smooth transition. We're so thankful to the Lord for that. So um, I worked here in the past. Um, uh, eight years ago, I was on staff as the staff arranger and I led a contemporary service here and so um, the short version is my former boss Scott White who served here for 25 years um, asked if I would consider coming to replace him uh, he wanted uh, Jeremy to be able to serve alongside a worship pastor for the long haul like he was able to do with uh, Pastor Johnny Hunt and so it was too big to not pray about uh, and as uh, we started praying, uh, the Lord just started confirming it all over the place. Uh, I tell people we were minding our own business in Nashville, and uh, we're having having a great time at a great church there. And so, uh, but uh, God's been so faithful, even uh, a year later, to continue to confirm uh, that move. And so we're we're excited about that. Uh, and the, for the past eight years, I served at Brentwood Baptist. Uh, that's where I met Alex, and we got to serve together and uh, worship together on the same campus for a good season of that. So uh, when I moved to Brentwood eight years ago, uh, we had two campuses. Uh, when I moved from Brentwood, uh, there were eight campuses. And so quite the transition there, uh, quite the change in that eight year stretch. And so uh, part of my role as just an associate on the main campus was to help merge some of those campuses. Some of our campuses were uh, uh, existing churches that we merged with. And so we, uh, with, you know, kind of pour Brentwood Baptist DNA into those congregations. And um, it was really rewarding. Uh, nothing that was on my radar when I went there, but it was a great opportunity. And then for the last uh, three and a half years of my time, I was at our South Campus, which was the first plant of Brentwood Baptist. Um, and where Alex and I attended. And so I was the worship pastor there um, for three and a half years before uh, making the journey back to Georgia. I'm a Georgia native. Uh, uh, my wife and I both are April. We met um, in college. We went to Shorter University, a small Baptist school in Rome, Georgia. And uh, uh, that's where uh, uh, we started serving together even before we liked each other in a church plant. Uh, uh, out of uh, the Georgia Baptist Convention, and so uh, that was our. Uh, we were been we've been doing ministry together for a long time. Uh, we've been married 18 years. Uh, we have uh, four kids, um, three biological and one adopted. So we we thought the Lord moved us to Nashville for a lot of reasons, but one surprise reason was uh, that He brought a little boy into our home uh, through foster care and allowed us to uh to make him a Duran after three years and so um so uh, uh mac sydney elijah is our adopted son and then emma kate so uh everybody's transitioned well and they're they're doing well in this uh in this movie we just celebrated one year back at first woodstock uh to add to an already interesting year we uh uh, transition a pastor and then uh, went through a staff reorg uh, with new leadership in place and uh, just fresh eyes on everything. Um, we uh, announced that transition uh, two weeks before COVID and so 
that was a, an interesting season. So uh, my role here as a worship pastor um, is over, I'm uh, over what you see and what you hear. So that involves um, all communications um, and uh, music and audio as well. So um, I serve with two lead directors uh, who uh, help me uh, lead our other directors on those teams. So uh, Jake Holman is our contemporary worship pastor. He also facilitates and equips our student-led worship services. And so uh, Jake is over what you hear. So our instrumental director, children's music, and um, audio uh, all uh, are under uh, Jake's supervision. And then Morgan Cron is our um, over what you see. So Morgan uh, was uh, is a social media, was social media before stepping into this role. She was on our staff previously and does a phenomenal job. So she leads our video team, also our graphics team, uh, and manages the many projects that come uh, through, through them. So uh, that's a uh, so when I came, I was just uh, just over the musicians, just us music guys hanging out. So that's been a a little bit of a a little bit of a change curve, um, but we're enjoying the process and enjoying learning um, uh, these different uh, aspects of ministry and how to work together. So it's been it's been really good. Yeah, that's great. And just even hearing some aspects of your story, it made me kind of think of some other questions or topics to, to kind of have you talk about. The whole point of Let's Talk is to, be, is to get those two teams in the room together and realize that whether or not on an org chart they're together or not, our, what we communicate and what we do with worship, they're, the Venn diagram, the middle, is, is there's so much overlap. And so trying to... Um, even in our talks, we're talking music, we're talking communications, music, communications, and really working through all those avenues. So um, I guess the first question I would ask would, would be to stay in that vein. Um, as you've transitioned from mostly working with musicians in your, in your career, in your ministry, to now navigating oversight with social media and website and all of that, maybe what are some of the things that you've learned in, in how, to, how to direct all of that? Yeah, you know, I uh, I would definitely claim no expertise uh, just a few months in, but I can say um, I love looking at our at our reorg and seeing um, everything you just said, Matt. Like the how all of these are so connected, um, even in the midst of of uh, uh, this pandemic, having to um, you know, our online presence obviously has changed dramatically and, uh, all of us being able to work together and cohesively to, for the same goal, for the same goal of excellence. And, uh, it's really, really been good for our team. It's kind of like when you, you know, um, you, you put together a, a mission trip team and, and, and they're, launched into a trip together and they they learn they grow closer together they learn how to function it's kind of we just kind of got thrown into the deep end you know right out of the gate but honestly um it's been really good it's been really good for us so yeah uh, coming into the uh, communications world uh has been really good um i uh i read a a book that was recommended to me by the creative guy at the north american mission board adam bain uh, it's called Herding Tigers is the name of the book. And uh, it's how to lead creatives. And uh, it's a secular book. So keep that in mind if you're uh, jotting the title down, uh, but really helpful just on, you know, how to, um, we, we all come to the table with ideas and, and, um, and with a lot of creativity. And so how to, how to steer that and navigate that and um, make everybody feel like they have a seat at the table. Um, uh, is, uh, has been really good for me. Um, and, uh, again, I, I don't know that I'm doing that, uh, hundred percent great all the time, but it's definitely the goal, um, to really, f I, I would love for each person on our team to feel like they're thriving in their, in their God given gifts and their, and their abilities, the Lord has given them. And, and so that's a, a big goal for me. Obviously at the end of the day, we have to be on the same page and on the same journey together. And so, I think you can you can guide people down the same road 
while still allowing them, you know, uh, creative freedom and allowing them to uh, be able to speak into, um, you know, uh, our mission together. Accomplish a lot of those things. It's just in our uh, Tuesday production meeting. It's just a, a time where we're all in the same room together. Uh, even when we did the reorg, my first goal was to get our whole team on the same hallway, just so, um, I mean, we were spread all over this campus. And so just the cohesiveness of um, being able to, to serve one another outside of our own job descriptions, to be able to offer helping hands, second opinions, uh, a second set of eyes on a on a you know print piece like all of those things are so more easily accomplished now just by physically you know being in the same same area so that's been good um, our production meeting um is is uh, twofold one is looking back at the week before and talking through what were our wins uh if we could go back and and redo something what would that be and you know um, as a as a leader, I try to be the first one to say, you know what, I I could have done this better. I could have uh, I really, you know, in evaluating what I said there, it could have had more intentionality behind it, or you know, just trying to lead by example and and uh, owning some things that I want to to get better at. And and so that's been a um, those meetings always. Each one has their own uh their own flair you know and it's interesting to see how they go and then obviously part of that meeting is looking ahead as well so um the goal is for everybody to have freedom to share in that room and um uh and that we we all uh want the same thing there are obviously different ideas that will come across the table but uh we get a lot of great great conversations and great ideas accomplished in that time together well, and that's, that's actually been a conversation for us uh, in, in the last little season has been how to make those two teams feel like one team together uh, and creating space to hear on both sides. You know, every once in a while you have a conversation with a, a, a sound guy who says, God, my worship leader just doesn't listen to what I have to say. And then you talk to the worship leader and like, well, I'm a sound guy doesn't listen to what I have to say. Sure. And uh, creating space for value where each voice is valued. Um, and if you're in a situation where you're bivocational, you're at a smaller church and you don't, you, know, you don't have staff uh, that are filling these positions, even a weekly phone call or a weekly text message chain, or in this season, everyone's kind of on the zoom train. So maybe you have a, a, a Monday morning zoom before everyone goes into work and you just talk through some of those things, but um, yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, honestly. And Matt, you, you bring up a great point. I, uh, you know, a lot of times when you're, when you're serving in a large church, um, people just assume that's, that's all, you know, I, I grew up with a bivocational pastor, like our, everybody in our church leading uh, was there on a volunteer basis, you know? And so, um, but you're right. The whole key is how you communicate with your team. Uh, it, it goes beyond you know, uh, we're on staff or we're not on staff, uh, uh, we're volunteer or a mix of both. And so, um, yes, it, it's, uh, before coming to first Woodstock, I had one, uh, part-time, uh, production coordinator or assistant basically. And so, uh, you know, you get, you get a lot done with your volunteers, but it's, uh, it's, uh, staying connected with them is, a is definitely a, a huge part of that. Well, and I, I love what you said about uh, the way you lead in that meeting is by owning things that, that you could have done better. Uh, I call that give the gift of going second. So if the leader is able to say, here's where I messed up, here's what I need to do better, here's where I need to grow, it allows freedom for everyone else to do that. Um, well, Cliff, let me backtrack to kind of your time coming. So you, you were a part of a church plant in Rome. Then you come to uh, Brentwood. And there's this, this campus expansion, there's, uh, you're getting involved in planting campuses, you're having uh, parts of your church then merge with existing fellowships. And, and to be honest, in my world, I'm seeing a lot more of that, where uh, young churches and older churches are, are banding together for kingdom impact. I would just love to hear, what are some of the lessons that you've learned in the midst of working in kind of 
church or campus mergers and revitalizations because that that's huge right now. Our, our churches are kind of walking in revitalization or merger situations a lot. We'd love to just hear some thoughts on that. Yeah, and that's a that's a great question. And um, you know, a, a few things on that. You know, a church, the churches we merged with, uh, the campus that Alex and I served at was a more like a church plant model. So it was a a group from that area who moved from the Rentwood campus to start a church. So they met in a school, then an office park, and then eventually a campus. So, um, but about half of our uh, campuses uh, were from existing congregations. And so those conversations were initiated by that campus who reached out to Brentwood Baptist, especially as, as word would spread about us adding campuses and, you know, trying to have a, a, a far reach, you know, among Middle Tennessee, uh, communities. And so we, um, the biggest thing uh, uh, right out of the gate is just to evaluate where that church is, you know, from a music and worship perspective, you know, just to, um, uh, the worst thing I could do in that scenario is to walk in and change everything overnight, um, to walk in to, for a, for a congregant from that campus to walk in the next, Sunday and not know anybody on the platform or not know any song that's being sung, you know, like, so these changes have to be super subtle. Um, before I came to First Woodstock the first time, um, between my church plant and First Woodstock, I served at a, was around 60. They hired a 24 year old pastor and he hired his 23-year-old buddy from college to be his worship pastor. And so uh, they hired intentionally young to reach another generation behind them. And that was such an awesome season of ministry. But what we learned through that is we may feel like we're moving at a slow pace, but it's an appropriate pace for people to cope with change, to be able to accept new changes. So one example, they just had piano and organ when I went to this church and so after being there for a while, I just bought a drum set and I just set it on the stage and I never even mentioned it. You know what I mean? I just let it be there. And then finally a church member was like, Hey, when are we going to use those things? And that's when I knew, okay, I think they're ready maybe to, you know, let those be implemented into the, into the worship service. So um, similar with a church uh, merger with adding a campus um, uh, to see where they are, uh, involve as many of the existing congregation members as you can but for them to see an intentional effort of hey there's some new there's some new people up there uh, there's some new people involved in leading and and so uh, each of those mergers were different some already had church staff and so we would partner with you know uh, someone already leading worship or somebody who already you know was a member of the band or a member of the choir so um, but to to be real um attentive to where they are and then to make slow transitions um to get them where you want them to go and i think you know regardless of whether your church is in a revitalization mode or in you know conversations about a potential merger what cliff's talking about in terms of uh slow motion in terms of in making changes there's, there's a ton of wisdom in that. So if you're, you know, you may be in a situation where you're wanting to make a cultural shift in your worship. Uh, maybe that has to do with the, the way the music sounds or who's leading or, or any of those kind of things, being able to take those slowly. And especially if you can look at it and figure out here's where we are, here's where we'd like to go. Where are the points of alignment? Cause that's really your starting point and you highlight those and then make subtle shifts off of that. So to say they have piano and organ. So that's where we started. There was enough alignment there that we could start there. And then I put the drums on stage. Then people started asking about the drums. It's just taking some of those small intentional steps, but not going too fast. I, it made me think about platform leadership too. Cliff, you said this, I just um, have been reminded lately that, um, trying to allow platform leadership to reflect the dynamics of the church. So where our church plant was, was brought into a situation where we merged with an existing uh, church. And so having 
having both age demographics and everything in between represented on stage in some form or fashion has, has really helped us. Um, Absolutely. Well, so Cliff, Cliff is quite humble in that at no point so far has he mentioned the amount of songs that he, he's songs and projects what are you thinking about when you go into a piece of music or a work or a project um, just, just maybe give us some insight into that. Yeah, man, that's a great question. Um, for me, uh, uh, each each project is unique. Um, uh, sometimes I, sometimes it's collaborating with other uh, uh, other writers or just with a publisher who has a concept. I'm working on a Christmas project right now, and. Um, uh, the publisher and I are just emailing ideas back and forth, trying to see, see if anything sticks, you know, see if, uh, if anything really resonates. And so, um, as from an arranging standpoint, my first question is always, what is, uh, what's the long range goal for the song? It's interesting how the, the role, uh, church choir and orchestra resource, uh, industry has changed even since I, started arranging uh now wow uh almost 20 years ago so uh the back then i would say a vast majority of what i would work on uh were designed for presentational use you know they were they were those special music songs those anthems that you know were going to be uh sung over your congregation and not necessarily with and so now I would say um, it's at least 50-50 and maybe towards some songs that will church to sing them. And so um, I really enjoy both um, for different reasons. Uh, you know, creatively, there's nothing like taking a song and knowing you can uh, uh, create it, arrange it in any way you want, just to go from a presentational standpoint. Um, but to get a worship song or to be handed a hymn that you're asked to to kind of, you know, uh, refresh, uh, update um, uh, is also rewarding because you're equipping a music ministry to lead their congregation in worship. And so I honestly enjoy both um, for different reasons. Um, but that's always my first question. And Sometimes if I don't know, uh, I'll ask the publisher, like, what, what's your goal for this song? Uh, sometimes they'll want me to do a worship song, but they're, they want it to feel like, like a big presentation. Um, if I have any being uh, congregational eventually, you know, I'm not going to throw uh, tricks in there for the congregation or an ending that they can never manage to follow. You know, you find your creative outlets in those arrangements with uh, instrumentation, maybe board substitutions, but structure-wise and for the original melody, things like that. I wanna be sure that you're setting your choir and orchestra up for a win with the congregation and that they can stay engaged the whole time. There's nothing worse, man, than well, there are probably things worse than this, but one thing I can't stand is for the congregation to be all bought into this moment, but then halfway through the song or for the ending, the choir takes off into another direction that you couldn't follow if you had a music degree yourself, you know? And so I try to think of things like that um, when, I'm, when I'm working on a, on a piece. And so a songwriting perspective, uh, I really started songwriting um, based on a need i would be working on a project and you know i, I needed a song that the community really specific and i couldn't find it and so um I, I started uh collaborating with other other songwriters and um have really enjoyed uh that part of of uh creativity as well musically 
And so I, now I try to write more as a, as a discipline um, and, and not just when I to keep co-writes on calendar all the time um, uh, with just a, you know, a handful of folks that I um, know I can stay connected with. So uh, I always try to songwrite with people who are way better songwriters than me. So I can uh, uh, make sure I've got a, a respect for somebody to say, hey, that's, a, that's not a great idea. You know, I, it's very, uh, very seldom these days I write a song uh, by myself completely. And it's just for that, you know, iron sharpening iron kind of scenario to songwriting. I know we can have a better result if there are two people involved. Well, and I think that's a good word. Even when it comes to selecting the songs for your church, you know, having that in mind as a for presentation. So this is going to be sung over our congregation to as a time of prayer for them to reflect on the words, to set up the message, or is this a congregation? What's the end goal of this song? Yeah. And I think that is helpful when it comes to looking at music, making selections to at least even have that in your mind. Um, what I love about Cliff stuff is that you you are not in one little vein of where you have written and, and arranged. And, and I, I love that. Your, your stuff's all over the place, which is great. Um, it is because he, uh, Cliff, you, you have had investment in a lot of different areas. So we've already talked about church plants, revitalizations. You know, big, but I have, I've loved, loved watching be involved in the development of the next generation. Uh, so because you're over there in Georgia, it's like I, I think last year you did a, a big kind of workshop with students and a big student choir over there in Georgia. And um, just talk a little bit about that. You know, you have people pour into you and we all want to see the next generation raised up. What, what, what are those intentional kind of steps looking like for you in this season, maybe even as you've moved? moved Man, thanks so much for asking. I love talking about this. Um, you know, I can think back and I'm sure all of us on this uh, on this call can relate like we're we're doing what we do today most likely because of the influence of people who have poured into us and so um, all, all the way from, you know piano teachers to uh, ministers of music to chorus teachers at school band directors whatever there have been those key influences along the way and I mean honestly I even even my life in the arranging world, you know, um, was because uh, Mike Speck, another choral arranger, uh, gave Monday to to collaborate with him, and and you know that that opened the door for me to even have these opportunities today. And so, um, so yes, reaching back to the generations behind us is a huge deal to me. Um, a, a few just practical ways we're doing that now. Um, I, uh, at Station Hill, the campus Alex and I were at in Spring Hill, we opted, we were looking for ways to, to grow and develop our students musically. And, and, you know, this, this can look a lot of different ways, depending on what your church culture is. And so when I went to Brentwood Baptist, there's not a student choir culture there. Um, and I know that's a challenge now more than ever. Um, you know, I've, I've had parents I like, man, student choir was everything when I was a kid. Um, why don't we that for, for my children? And sometimes, depending on who the person is, sometimes I'll say, because travel ball didn't exist when you were a kid, you know, like we are, we are competing now uh, more than ever you know, for just the time and availability of our students to be plugged in. I, uh, um, we have to think creatively. If you, there's a great church in our area, student choir ministry, and and I love it, and they do incredible work, and that's to, I totally love to have that here. But in the meantime, sure, I'm going to um, find outlets for them. Nashville as well was to uh, give our students an opportunity to sing with our adult worship choir. So uh, there's a separate room um, in the student's day night. Uh, it's only a 30 minutes, fastest 30 minutes of the week for me. 
Um, but I, uh, I start out there before our rehearsal begins, adult worship choir. Um, I have some other adult leaders in there helping lead the way. And then every Sunday, those students have an opportunity to lead it with our adult choir. So a big win um, right now. I mean, it's, uh, you know, our, um, obviously there are more adults than students in that group, but I'm thrilled with where uh, immediately the church could feel the impact. You know, even large choir situation like we're in here, um, immediately spot students standing, you know, uh, with, surrounded by adults. And so just what that looks like from a multi-gen standpoint is, is uh, as rewarding as the end investment. Uh, I love the health and the, uh, the feel of having those generations together. So um, that number is not, um, not massive yet, but it's definitely big enough to make, to make an impact. And so mainly in that rehearsal on Wednesday nights, I'm just working on traditional anthems, you know, the, so it's not even always like the most hip, you know, uh, youth oriented song. Um, but, uh, uh, it's gone really well. So they, they know a lot of the worship songs I'm, I'm teaching our congregation. I don't spend as much time rehearsing the worship set and just kind of dive into the next, um, of more present anthem kind of song, the students. And, um, I'm, I'm seeing what the Lord's doing through that. And then, um, I mentioned Jake, our leader um jake does a great job um, of and giving them opportunities to be a, in the band school or high school worship um they have a great even an online uh kids can uh you know download a, a track to play with and submit that um, either vocally or instrumentally and so uh, we've seen some good results from and some uh, a big uptick in our student involvement um, in those uh, two venues on Wednesday nights. Well, I, I love that the handful of things. You know, even some of the people who are on this now have dual roles, so it's students and music. I love the idea of bringing some of those students in early to go ahead and start working with them so that, you know, they, they may have, they may have homework to do after youth stuff and can't stay for a choir practice, but you've worked with them. They get to sing with those. The, and also, I don't know if y'all caught this with what Cliff said, but he's got other adult leaders in there. We talk about disciples who make disciples who make disciples from Cliff to those adult leaders down to those kids like that, that starts a movement of, of the, I think they're in the right culture. And I, so I love that. Um, Cliff, we've got just a few more moments. I would love to hear this. This season's been weird. You just said you just celebrated your one year and having your senior pastor move to an emeritus COVID hits. Uh, Cliff, maybe, maybe what's something that you have, have learned or an attribute of God or something that has just kind of steadied you through this season? Man, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I, I've been reading over and over again um, Psalm 13, and Psalm 13 is just a few verses, but more, more consecutive times in that passage um, uh, than any other Psalm. David asked, "How long, O Lord?" I mean, if you've ever have kids, you've taken a road trip where you've asked, "Are we there yet? How long?" And so. You know, from the from the start of this, man, it, it's been a constant challenge to slip into that mindset. I mean, to say, how long do we have to, uh, you know, wade through this? And so, um, for me, um, Psalm Psalm 13 is a great uh, a great model for where I want to end up when I'm when I'm asking those questions. Let me just yeah, um, the the end of the psalm. So to Think about how our he says, how long, oh Lord, uh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take my take counsel in my soul or in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? I mean, that's just two verses, and he's asked that question four different times. 
But listen by the end in verse five, he says, but I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Will sing to the Lord bountifully with me. But in even six short verses, man, a lot of frustration, but that he could still end trusting the Lord and not just trusting him, but sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. You know, no matter um, how frustrating the season has been, um, God is good and he's still um, none of this is surprising to him. Uh, none of this uh, um, greater than what he can handle. And so for me to trust him, it's reason. And so, you know, we, if you've been a worship leader for one month, you've probably heard the phrase audience of one you know there's only one and i we've all practiced that right with these online services like who is tired of singing to a camera right but great reminder for me like okay lord we're doing this for years and here i am sitting in a room with uh cameras staying so uh, uh just as much as it would be uh, with a phone. Um, the Lord uh, in an online server and a gathering is uh, equal no matter what. Uh, uh, that's, that's such a good encouragement. I love, I love where David ends that up too. And I hope and pray that that can be our response, that we can look at how the Lord has dealt with us back and we, we will sing, continue to trust uh, that he's good. And for us. man, thank you so much. Uh, we're we're glad that you've moved from Tennessee to Georgia. You know you're closer now. now. That's exciting. Uh, but again, thanks for being. Want to introduce us to to our absolutely. And thank you, Cliff, for in introducing me. Man, it's it's uh, all uh, uh, Cliff or uh, whatever whatever you like to say. It's it's all it's all at the club. Best and Alex, uh, I'm so thankful uh, that that uh, the Lord has worked all this out, and I I know I know you know Me that as well. Me too. <laughs> For such a time as this, and so uh, we're going to have uh, Zach Snyder from Creative Collective named uh, Black Bar in Church outside of uh, Baltimore, Maryland, uh, a black channel that has been instrumental. Channel, being, uh, church media teams, uh, streaming, church streaming, the social thing, and any of all those questions. Uh, they just released a new kit about how to have a, uh, um, uh, a, a built-in kit under a thousand dollars. So if that's you and your church, you definitely want to next week to hear what Zach has to say together. Until then, we hope to see you soon.